We have got such an exciting afternoon for you. If you thought the morning was any good, you ain't heard nothing yet. The, the, uh, I spent a lot of my uh, uh, life, clinical life at University College Hospital where this interoperative uh, radiotherapy was being developed. I take absolutely no, no uh, pleasure from telling you that I wasn't involved with it at all. But I saw it going on around me and I saw how enthusiastic um, the, my colleagues were in, in focusing on this. And it's a delight now that I can see that uh, their research has come into fruition and we look forward to having the whole background. So really it's like introducing a lot of old friends and I'm introducing first Professor Jayant Wadia, who is Professor of Surgery and Oncology at University College Hospital and also at the Whittington Hospital and at the Royal Free Hospital. And he was certainly one of the absolute rising lights um, to be involved with uh, interoperative radiotherapy from the beginning. And so, Jay, if you've got a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, really f a great pleasure and honor for, to speak here. We started this uh, meeting with the nucleus of intraoperative radiotherapy, but uh, patient choice was the main theme, and uh, I'm delighted that the morning has gone absolutely beyond my possible expectations. And I'm really scared that I hope I can do <laughs> anything to do with what has happened in the morning. So uh, I'll talk on intraoperative radiotherapy. My talk has a few um, graphs, but to balance it, I've got several photographs, and I'm a fan of photographs. So you'll see, uh, I want to talk two slides. Go this way. Uh, so this is the potential conflict of interest, and potential is important. Uh, is I received funding from, UC, uh, from Department of Health. I have received honoraria from Carl Zeiss and uh, travel reimbursements and my clinical practice is in breast cancer surgery and oncology. Now I just wanted to do two slides on the morning talks. Is This is the data about invasive breast cancer incidence in Fife in Scotland. So when I was working in Fife, the, the, the ISD statistics could tell me how many breast cancer patients were diagnosed in a particular year. And these are invasive breast cancers, not DCIS, not precancers. And what you can see, thank you very much. What you can see here is before screening was introduced, the incidence was somewhere around 100. On the first screening round, it went up. So what was being done found here? These are invasive cancers, which would have been found later on, and therefore being diagnosed early. So nice and so good. You should have found a, you should have felt found a dip here. Can't find a dip. It keeps happening every time a screening round comes, which happens every three years. You have a peak of incidence of invasive breast cancer, I haven't been able to find a reduction in incidence in the following years. What else is this? It's from 100 to 150. What was happening to these cancers when screening didn't happen? What other elegant way of demonstrating over diagnosis than this? So this was, when I suggested publication, the chair of the ISD said, well, I can't, we can't, I can't put my name to this. It will be, we'll have to stop screening. So it never got published until it was published in the BMJ in letters column. The second point about HRT is this was again study in Scotland where the population is generally stable, so everybody is, doesn't move too much, and all their HRT use is well documented in terms of H, um, prescriptions in NHS. So from the ISD office, again, I could get a number of prescriptions for HRT, and as Dr. Blooming has shown, it fell sharply after the publication of the data, what we didn't find was there was no change in the incidence of breast cancer. So these patients are women, are those where screening is common, and unlike how it is in the US, where screening happens as a, a matter of opportunity. So those are two other th findings that support what has been said in the morning. Now I'll talk about intraoperative radiotherapy. So when I qualified as a surgeon or when I was training as a senior registrar in India and women were being told you have breast cancer and the next question I had to ask can you travel or can you stay in Bombay for six weeks for radiotherapy if you do an operation to preserve your breast 
And if they said yes, then we said we can preserve your breast. If they said no, we said, well, you must have a mastectomy because it is not safe to do a lumpectomy without giving radiotherapy. And this is not a situation only in Bombay in 1992, but it is there today in many parts of the world. My colleagues in US tell me that to cross the San Francisco bridge, people on one side of the bridge choose to have breast conserving surgery because they can travel every day to radiotherapy center. On the other side of the bridge in the county hospital, they can't do this travel every day for six weeks. So they choose to have a mastectomy. And that's not just in US, it happens in Australia, as Dr. Professor Christopher Saunders is here, sees happening all the time. So the other thing that was happening was concern about breast cancer patients who were obliged to choose a mastectomy only because they could not take whole breast radiotherapy. The other point was curiosity. Do breasts which have one cancer have other cancers? And that was a well-known fact that there are other cancers in the breast. What was thought is they are widespread all over the they are around the main tumor. So what I did in this hospital was to, after a mastectomy was done, I would take the specimen up to the lab, cut it up, and take x-rays. At the end of it, after plotting it in three dimensions, I found that breast with one cancer has multiple other cancers in the breast in two-thirds of women. Mm -hmm. Ah, that just means everybody should have a mastectomy. Isn't that right? But luckily, we had trials of breast-conserving surgery with and without radiotherapy. And what did they find? They found that if recurrences occurred, they occurred around the main tumor. There were recurrences in other parts, but they were as common as they were in the other breast, suggesting that the other areas in the breast, which were found microscopically by careful examinations, were probably dormant and didn't need treatment. And this is not dissimilar from what we find in thyroid cancer. We find in prostate cancer that not all cancers grow. So, that was the conclusion, reverse of what the finding was, paradoxically, that since most recurrences occur around primary tumor, we thought it makes sense to give radiotherapy only around the tumor. And if you could give it during the operation, that would save women from having a mastectomy unnecessarily. With this, I came to London and met Professor Baum and Professor Tobias, and that's how the story started. So this was academic insight that led to the idea that we should give radiotherapy only to the tumor bed during lumpectomy, that led to collaboration with the industry to develop a device to test this new hypothesis, and then <coughs> clinical trials to test the new approach in which we were testing both the device as well as the approach, based on the principle of precision and immediacy. So this is the slide which shows you the machine which is sitting outside. You can see the machine in real life in the uh, other room in which this globe enters the breast in this way. This is the cavity left behind after the tumor is excised and radiotherapy is given to the tissues immediately opposed to this spherical applicator. It is focused. It does not reach normal structures such as the heart and the lungs and it is precision and immediacy. Now that is a good idea but logic doesn't always work in uh, medicine let alone breast cancer. So well you can see this in 1998 uh, I have changed, but many others have not changed in any way. That's Professor Baum, that's Professor Saunders, and Professor Tobias. And that is Dr. Spittle there, and there. So this is 1998. So, yeah, Christopher is, yeah, yes. That's what, yeah. So, and we, yes, I took some cheeky photographs, and that is one of the photographs. Which two of us are here, and Professor Tobias is taking the photograph. So. Yes, that is, um, and when we met <laughs> Professor Frederick Wenz, we had really got into a fast car because that made a big difference to the acceleration of our project. <laughs> and this is the International Steering Committee and not all members are here, but every member has played a huge role in this, in this thing and what photographs of Christopher Graves and Ingrid are not here, they're not always very happy for me to show their photographs, so that's why their names are there. But Chris, Ingrid and Norman are part of the Surgical Interventional Trials Unit, without whose help any of these trials would never have happened, and there was no funding at that time. It was only sweat and blood and toil, as somebody else um, whose statue is in the Parliament Square said it. So, um, so the target trial. So target A trial is a randomized clinical trial that compared two types of approaches. One is a risk-adapted radiotherapy, in which a single dose of radiotherapy is given, and if high risk factors are found, then additional radiotherapy can be given postoperatively. 
and that we expected to happen in about 15% of patients. And finally, that's what happened. The other group, I call it one size fits all, which is not liked by everybody, but it is almost the case, is that everybody gets whole breast radiotherapy. We started with 2,232 patients, but then the number expanded to 3,500 patients, and this was a randomized trial for anybody <coughs> who is over the age of 45 with a single breast cancer, with a size about 3.5 centimeters in size. And acknowledgments are due to 30, 31 centers in, in the world, in 11 countries, patients, clinicians, and staff from all these hospitals. So it is a trial from uh, so many patients, one trial, two treatments, 11 countries, 12 years, 42,000 forms, and about 1.5 million data fields. So it was a big, big study, and Professor Max Balsara, uh, who works in Australia, we spend a lot of time together early morning on Skype when doing the analysis. So target A trial accrual was from 2000 to 2012. We published the data for the first time in The Lancet in 2010, and as planned, we analyzed it again in 2012 and published it in 2013-14, where we found, and this was our conclusion, which was put on the masthead by Lancet, quite surprised to me on the day when it came out, is for selected patients with early breast cancer, a single dose of targeted radiotherapy delivered at the time of surgery should be considered as an alternative to external beam radiotherapy. And that was in 2010. That's eight years ago. A full report was published in 2016. This is by Department of Health publication. And uh, the whole of that 250-page report is available for public. So what are the most important results? The most relevant results in the dark cloud that uh, a woman faces is what is my chance of being alive without breast cancer coming back in the breast? And that answer is this. The red line and the blue lines are the two arms of the randomized clinical trial. And what you find that there are 57 events versus 59 events, it's a strange way of saying an event, is somebody has had a local recurrence or somebody has died. That counts as an event. And you find that the two arms are light on top of each other at five years. If you do disease-free survival, that is any disease coming back, even that, the two arms are on top of each other. So here you have data that shows that the two are as good as each other in terms of controlling cancer and usually more convenient. And in order to explain this to, well, Idiot's Guide is this one in which you have each dot representing a woman. The gray dots are those who have died in target arm versus EBRT arm. And the, the brown dots are those who have had local recurrence. The difference between the two is not statistically significant, but numerically they are slightly different in each way. <coughs> and this we feel should be one way in which women could be explained the difference between the two groups to make a decision which they would want to choose. One of the criticisms of the target, trial, target A trial is that, oh, the follow-up is not long enough. But it's a very large trial. And the first 1,222 patients have a median follow-up of five years, which is considered <coughs> adequate. Now, what might be the reason why it's considered adequate? This is one of the reasons. Biologically, what you find is that, I'm giving an example of another study, a Swedish trial, in which one group, the yellow line, is the group which received no radiotherapy, and the red, uh, blue line received radiotherapy. And you can see that this is the difference in local recurrence. The difference in local recurrence, most of it is finished by the time you reach five years. Most of it appears in the first two to three years. And then, whatever he was supposed to happen at 25 years is already seen at five years. This is the effect of radiotherapy on local recurrence. So we believe, and you can see the hazard between the two groups, all of it is in the first four or five years, which you can see here as well. Suggesting that whatever effect we have seen in the first five years is the effect of radiotherapy and is unlikely to change with longer follow-up. One other option is that, oh, patients in the target A trial were such a good prognosis that they don't need radiotherapy at all. Well, we have had clinical trials of no radiotherapy, and in those trials, which have much smaller numbers than the target A trial, 600, 1,100, and 1,300, they had extremely good prognosis patients with smaller cancers, older patients, lower grade, node negative, ER positive. Even then, they had up to one in 17 patients who had a local recurrence with no radiotherapy. And what happened in the target A trial? If you have 2,200 patients who were only age was 45, and there was no restriction on any of these, and the 
the, the difference was 2.1% versus 1.1% overall, statistically not significant. And if you have one single uh, selection criteria of having hormone receptor positive patients, then it is 1.4% versus 1.1%. Or who, which patient would want to have a local recurrence risk of 1 in 17 or 1 in 71? And I think that is a clear answer there. What about the main biological hypothesis which we started with when I started the talk is that the other cancers in the breast <coughs> do not matter. Now this is the study which was published in 1996 that two-thirds of breast should have other cancers and 80% of these should be in other quadrants. So giving radiotherapy only to the tumoral, peritumoral tissue just not, does not jeopardize local control. That is the hypothesis. So if two-thirds of the patients have additional foci, 80% of these are in other quadrants, therefore 0.8 times 0.63 is 0.5. That's about half the patients should have recurrences in other quadrants. And what did we find? In the trial, we had 800 patients who had only radiotherapy around the tumor. You should have had 400 patients who should have recurrence in other quadrants. And what we found is that there were seven who recurred in the scar, six who recurred in other, other breast, and of these 405 supposedly malignant cancers, only two recurred. So really, there isn't much difference between these and these don't all recur. And what happened in the randomized trial? In the randomized trial, whether they had IORT as the randomized arm or EBRT, number of recurrences in the other quadrants was exactly the same, suggesting that our hypothesis is probably right and putting it distilling down to the patients who are really going to be treated in IORT, you find that the difference in local recurrence for those group of patients who are selected to be ER positive and IORT is given during surgery, you find there is no difference in local recurrence. Those two lines are on top of each other. There seems to be a difference in deaths. Now I'm going to come to that, and that is really very important. So death is a very important endpoint, particularly when there are more deaths than local recurrences in the population of breast cancer patients whom we treat. Of these 3,500 patients, there were 88 deaths. 52 were from breast cancer and 36 from bre 52 were from other causes and 36 were for breast cancer. So there were more deaths from other causes in patients diagnosed to have breast cancer within this trial. There were 34 local recurrences. So these 52 deaths and 88 deaths are really quite an important endpoint. So what did we find in the target trial in terms of total number of deaths? And you plot this graph showing this is 0%, that's 10%, it's not 100%. And what you can see that these blue lines are separating. There seem to be more deaths in patients who are randomized to receive external beam radiotherapy compared with intraoperative radiotherapy. There is no difference in breast cancer deaths but there seems to be a statistically significant difference in deaths from other causes. And what could be the other causes? The other causes difference was from deaths from other cancers and deaths from cardiovascular causes. The numbers are small, it's two and eight, so they are not very large number of patients, but the difference was statistically significant, suggesting that it is likely not just by chance. An important analysis of those patients who were screen detected, and this has very much a relevance to what we have seen in the morning, is there were large number of patients in this were screen detected patients. You can see that. That is screen detected out of the whole number. Although there were significant number who were in the worst prognosis group, the screen detected patients were more than 2,000 patients. That's a large trial, even amongst those who were screen detected. And in screen detected patients, number of patients with breast cancer deaths were exactly very similar, statistically not different, but non-breast cancer deaths were significantly more when patients received whole breast radiotherapy. This was statistically significant and there were fewer deaths with IORT and overall there were fewer <coughs> deaths with uh, intraoperative radiotherapy, a difference of about 2%. So in screen detected patients there was a 2% difference in overall mortality. Is this plausible? And this paper was shown by Professor Baum earlier. This paper from Oxford shows that the toxicity from screening, from, from giving external beam radiotherapy to the heart, happens in the first five years even. So what we saw in the first five years is not too early. It is plausible. And because there was so much doubt whether it's really true or not, we did a meta-analysis of all trials in which radiotherapy was targeted to the area around the tumor. And we published this in the RED journal, which is a top radiotherapy journal. And it was one of the most downloaded paper in 2016. And what we showed is these are patients who have received 
this side, this graph is called forest plot, and if any of these results are on that direction, it favors partial breast radiation. If it's in this direction, it favors whole breast radiation in terms of these outcomes. So non, in terms of breast cancer deaths, this diamond, which is a summation of all these studies, sits on zero. There is no difference. If it sits on that side, it means that it is favors giving intraoperative radiotherapy or targeted radiotherapy. And it shows that there is total number of deaths are reduced by giving targeted radiation. And when the last study on this was published earlier this year, we published this in Lancet and updated it, showing that clearly by giving targeted radiation, there is a reduction in overall mortality. Now, if you look at the numbers from this, if it reduces mortality by one or two percent, doesn't sound large. And if you take the reverse, that giving normal radiotherapy increases by one or two percent, let's extrapolate this. 20,000 patients would be suitable. 1.3% mortality reduction would estimate 260 fewer deaths. If you had a faulty car that caused 250 deaths in a year on the roads, would that car not be recalled? So are we suggesting that we should not recall these? So it's imperative, I believe, at least, that this should be an option to suitable patients. And it gets worse. In smokers, and again this graph was shown in the morning, that if a smoker at the age of 50 gets external beam radiotherapy, their risk of dying from heart attack and lung cancer goes up to 25%, 23%. This is an increase of 6%. And by no way would giving external beam radiotherapy reduce their chance of dying by 6%. So 23% smokers who have external beam radiotherapy will unfortunately die because of heart attacks and lung cancer. This 6% increase is a large number and therefore giving radiotherapy intraoperative to these patients would in addition reduce their mortality by another 6%. So I believe that for patients who are smokers and screen detected, is it even ethical to continue to offer external beam radiotherapy? There is an interesting biological point I would like to make here, is this, is that timeliness of radiotherapy may be vital. And this is a study done in Italy with Dr. Samuele Massaruth and Dr. Gustavo Baldassare, in which we took wound fluids after an operation and put it on breast cancer cells to see if what effect it has. What we found is that putting wound fluid stimulates cancer cells. It's scary. We're doing an operation. Wound fluid is normally meant to improve wound healing, so it's stimulatory to cells. It seems to stimulate cancer cells as well. But what was a surprising and nice finding was that when the patients have had intraoperative radiotherapy, that wound fluid does not stimulate cancer cells. So it seems to abrogate the effect of wounding on microenvironment which the cancer cells face. And this is a very nice uh, diagram of video in which that is normal can cancer cells moving around in normal wound and bottom is they are moving around in uh, patients who have had intraoperative radiotherapy and it's a statistically significant difference in their movement. And this is because there is a big difference in the cytokines, the chemicals that are present in the wound in between the two groups of patients. So it seems to have a beneficial effect on microenvironment and that may be a reason why if they get both treatments, that is they get intraoperative radiotherapy plus whole breast radiotherapy, they seem to do better. They have a lower recurrence, they have recurrence rate which is much lower than expected and Strangely speaking, in patients who have both intraoperative and whole breast radiotherapy, uh, this yellow line, and remember this is a non-randomized comparison between those who receive intraoperative and whole breast radiotherapy and those who receive external beam radiotherapy, you find that there are fewer deaths from other causes. <coughs> Seems to be that giving radiotherapy during surgery has a systemic effect that's way beyond what we know. In addition, IORT gives better cosmetic outcome. It gives better quality of life. This is a study from Australia, again from uh, Tammy Corica and Christabel. It also is better for the environment. And this is a study done by uh, Mr. Nathan Coombs, who is in the audience. You can see these red dots are radiotherapy centers, and each circle is a 13-mile distance. So you can see how much part of the country is not covered in close distance to a radiotherapy center. And if this works, you'll hear Nathan's voice. I realise that while I've been driving this only once or twice a month, most of my patients will be asked to drive this at least three or four weeks um, for their radiotherapy. What a horrible journey I thought they had to put up with. OK, 
Okay, and we found in this study which was published is that on average, patients would save 30 hours of travel, 753 miles of distance, and 200 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. This is good for the world. <coughs> and lastly, they have, it is cost saving. And this is an estimate from Professor um, Steve, uh, <coughs> Steve Morris, that it would save ni up to 9 million pounds a year to the NHS, and that's an important point here. And this does not include patient or social factors, and this is published in a, uh, so I want to come back to this conclusion that this, sh this should be offered as a treatment. It has received a lot of news coverage and worldwide acceptance, and it has come in so many uh, news places, and I can see uh, this lady is in the audience, uh, and so is this, uh, and uh, it is, and there is uh, when it was accepted in Australian NICE for intraoperative radiotherapy, and you can see Dr. So Professor Saunders in that photograph. And you have seen uh, Kirsty in the morning chairing the session, and uh, that was her. And these are teams from Harlow and Swindon uh, who, have, who did the operations, and these are our various teams. We're going and seeing NICE, that is, that is in NICE, that is in UCL, that is when we attended the Houses of Parliament to campaign about this. Um, and it, we have had user meetings in Mannheim, chaired by Professor Wenz, in many years in US, and so on, and in Bangkok, and uh, that was the last meeting in 2018. So, what I'm trying to say is that 350 centers in 35 countries currently offer IORT, and those are the names. As of October 2015, 20,000 patients were treated with IORT. As of September 2018, that's three years down the line, my daughter is doing this, we have contacted, we have got responses from 31 centers, and they have treated 8,000 patients. If you extrapolate, it would go to 80,000, but assuming these are the most busy centers, at least 30 to 40,000 patients would have had the radiotherapy. And UK NICE recommended this treatment in centers that have the machine in January 31st, after three to four years of um, deliberations. And, but even though all these centers are offering, despite NICE recommendation, NHS patients, unfortunately, are not able to access this treatment, and I cannot imagine what the reason might be. One editorial in the top journal from the chief editor said this, and I would let you read this yourselves, and that is quoting a radiation oncologist, and personally, I cannot believe that any such conflict of interest would ever deter doctors from doing the right thing. Thank you.